Uh, Greenpeace Nordic is a Greenpeace regional office that covers the Nordic area, uh, but also the Arctic uh, region, which means that uh, we are quite active in Greenland and the rest of the Arctic as well, and Iceland. Um, it's not an easy act to follow, so it was very inspiring to hear the local perspective. It was very inspiring to hear uh, how much can be done on a local scale. I'm not sure I share his less optimistic view on our politicians. Maybe I share his analysis, but I think we have no other choice basically, then put a lot of faith in our politicians. We have 76 days and 20 hours until the COP15 begins in these buildings, as I'm sure I'm not the first one who've said today, uh, but it's a fact that we should not forget. Um, and that's what I will focus on today. I will not focus on the causes to climate change, not even the solution to climate change, I will focus on the very, very important task that we in Greenpeace think we have, which is to make sure that our politicians are completely aware of what the costs is if they fail in Copenhagen in 76 days. And that is why I'm so absolutely thrilled to be here today and for the invitation, because I think you guys, of course, are playing an absolute key role in getting that message through to our politicians. And I think it's absolutely stunning to see a, full, a room full of people with laptops in front of them. I mean, I think the first time that I've not felt really offended by that, but I understand that that's your tool and that's how you work, and that's uh, completely fine, but it is a little odd. Let's see if we can move forward. I'll go through four things, uh, and hopefully it will only take 20 minutes or so, so should be time for some Q&As afterwards. I'll say a little bit about what we in Greenpeace believe a good agreement in Copenhagen will look like. I'll also say a little bit about what agreement we think is likely at this stage. And I'll say a little bit about what Greenpeace is doing in order to get a good agreement. And hopefully also, in, by talking about that, hopefully inspire some of you to uh, dig more into the work that we're doing and hopefully find some of the stories that you may not have covered already on that. And finally, from a Greenpeace perspective, from my perspective, what would be absolutely marvelous if you guys were communicating in the coming weeks and months. Okay, this is how we see a good agreement in Copenhagen. I know you already had the EU perspective earlier today, uh, but from a Greenpeace perspective, a good agreement in Copenhagen looks like this. It must be fair, it must be ambitious, and it must be binding. That is absolutely key, and I think that's the lachmus test that should be hold against the final result in 79 or maybe 85 days when the agreement hopefully is there. Does it meet these standards or not? We believe that there are, in order for the agreement to be fair, we have to differentiate between what industrialized and developing countries need to uh, accomplish and commit to. For industrialized countries, it's absolutely clear that the reductions which is following from the IPCC and from the science, must be 40% at least in 2020. It's also clear that we are talking about a lot of money that needs to come on the table in order for the developing world to meet its target. So the industrialized country must commit to a financing package in the vicinity of 110 billion euros a year by 2020. So compared to where we are today, Right now, we have commitments from the industrialized countries with this, some loose, some pretty firm, in the vicinity of 10% reduction. That's what their national plans are sort of like adding up to if you put them all together, at least those who have put national targets out. So that's between 10 and 16% where we are now, basically. So there's quite a, a distance up to the 40%. As you may know, EU has more or less said that we would like to reduced with 20% and maybe even 30%. Uh, Japan came out uh, only a few weeks ago with the new government uh, saying that they will boost their reduction commitment from 8% to 25%. Uh, we have uh, different kinds of other commitments. I'll get back to some of them in a second, but, but it doesn't look completely good at the moment. For developing countries, we are... Uh, recognizing that their situation is a lot diff different from the uh, developing, uh, developed uh, world, and uh, we are asking together with uh, 
the science for a reduction in the vicinity of 15 to 30 percent below what a business as usual scenario would um, uh, apply, imply. And what is very important is that the deforestation rate is dropping very, very rapidly in the period up to 2020 and completely halting at 2020. It's of course extremely important that this agreement we get in Copenhagen is legally binding and that there's no loopholes in it. And it's very, very important that we get this peak in emissions by 2015 and that we bring it down close to zero in 2015. So some are asking, are we asking too much or a lot? There's a lot of voices now that we hear that is coming back to us and saying, oh, you've got to be realistic, it will be very difficult, we don't have the US on board, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is that we know now, the science is very clear on this, that these tipping points that we don't want to witness, that we don't want to see, they can occur even at average temperature rises below the two degrees. We also know that uh, the uh, IPCC recommendation says that even if we commit to these pretty strict reduction targets and reach them, that only gives us this 50% chance of staying below the two degrees. So it's already a crook game. I mean, it's, always, it's already very, very difficult to uh, reach where we want to go. Um, things to look out for in the coming weeks. I think there are some quite interesting things on, uh, on, uh, on its way. Um, one is, of course, that this week is extremely important. We have uh, the uh, UN meeting today and tomorrow, uh, Ban Ki-moon's climate meeting, uh, where we will uh, hopefully uh, see some new national commitments and some new clarity about different countries and what they will commit to. It will be followed directly by the G20 meeting. And some of the announcements that we are expecting in the coming days are, are these. Um, we expect that the Danish presidency will loud and clear say that getting heads of states to Copenhagen is a deal breaker if they're not coming, basically. It will not be a good agreement if heads of states are not showing up. So this is, of course, extremely important. If Obama and the others are not showing up in Copenhagen, we will have no chance of reaching a good agreement. They will, of course, only come if there is the likelihood that a good agreement can be made. So these two things are very, very <coughs> closely connected. I think we will also see that uh, the Association of Small Iceland, Island States uh, in the Pacific will come out and say that the two-degree target is no longer what they consider as being safe for their survival. They're looking now, with science in their hand, at a 1.5 degree average temperature rise as the safe limit to, to aim for. One good news that many are waiting for is uh, that China uh, announced their uh, national targets. Uh, we don't know how big it will be. We don't know if they will do it either, but it will be a very important uh, announcement if it happens, of course, because the US and many developed countries have used, especially China, as an excuse for not moving themselves. So therefore, it's extremely important to hear what China has to say. They are, of course, also saying that they will not commit to a, a treaty unless uh, the industrialized countries are securing the financing and securing uh, big reductions. But what they are saying is, despite any agreement in Copenhagen, they will put a national target on the table and a, a plan for how to reach it. And uh, it could be 20%, still a little low, but given the special situation China is in as a, a developing country, it would be extremely uh, uh, important for, for that to happen. Well, in the US, who knows what will happen there? I mean, what, who knows what will happen with the healthcare reform, what will happen with, um, with uh, whether or not uh, they will actually um, come, or whether or not Obama will come to Copenhagen at all, whether or not they're ready to commit. Right now, there's a lot of people who don't have a lot of faith in it. In Greenpeace, we tend to think that it's quite good that uh, the US or that Obama did not manage to uh, get the Waxman bill through Congress. Uh, we think uh, that's actually something that will hopefully not uh, tie his hand so he can show up with his delegation and be uh, more free. We'll see if that's true or not. But this thing's about heads of states to Copenhagen. I mean, I think this is something that I can't stress enough uh, the importance of you guys uh, supporting in 